All right. Welcome to this video and inside of this video we are looking at and going to be talking about divorce and why there is a 50 plus percent divorce rate all around the Western world and ultimately what to do about it. Now I understand you're watching this video, you're going, well, who the fuck are you? You look pretty young. How can you tell me about divorce when you have had barely any marriage experience? And you are correct, I've been married for eight years, I'm 34 right now. I've got two kids, I've got a four year old, I've got a 15 month year old, I have a business, my wife stays at home, looks after the kids and we work together as a family unit. Now, I don't have a lot of experience in that domain. I haven't been married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. However, it's not so much the time that you've done anything. Experience comes down to your ability to process things, your ability to go through things together, your experience of life together. And so when it comes to experience, I believe as an eight-year marriage, I have a decent understanding. I also have a decent understanding because I come from a family with six kids. I also have all five older siblings who have gone through marriage. I've observed them. I've looked at some that have gotten divorced. I've actually processed why. And so I've come to a bit of a conclusion on what makes a really good marriage and seven things that actually make or break a marriage. And I would love to hear your opinion down below. But these are the most important, I believe, seven things that you need to have inside of a marriage. Now, before we even start, let's talk about marriage for a second. I got married when I was like 26. I was sitting there. I'm like, we've been dating for two years you know what, heck, I need. I feel like I need to propose because everybody starts to propose. We're getting older, we've bought a house together. The next step is marriage. And I generally believe that most kids and most kids, many adults, go through life and then they, they get married for the wrong reasons. They don't get married thinking about these things. I had no conceptual idea of what marriage was. I had no conceptual idea about what being a father was, having kids and the roles and responsibilities. I was simply just moving along the, the train tracks of that next stage of life, which is, hey, you're kind of dating. Hey, you're kind of moving in together. Hey, you've kind of bought a house together. Well, what is the next step? The next step is that you propose. Why? Because there is this almost this built up tension that if you've been dating for too long and if you don't propose, people start talking. You, you, the mother-in-law starts to talk, her friends start to talk, your friends start to talk, what's going on? Oh my God, you've been dating for four years, you've been dating for five years, he's not gonna marry you. And then there's this place of scarcity where the, where, where the girl thinks that, oh my God, we've been together for eight years, if he's not gonna marry me, I'm gonna leave. And so there's that that you're fighting against. And as a man, you and I both know, if you're a man watching this, you and I both know, we have no fucking idea what we're getting ourselves into. We have no idea. And it's this peer pressure that gets us married. So first and foremost, the whole marriage is a bit of a sham at the start because we're not even doing it with the right intention. The problem is, well, here we are. Five years, 10 years, 15 years later, we're here with the cards that we've been dealt. We have a few kids, we've got life in the way, we've got a mortgage to pay, we've got taxes to pay, we've got all this shit that's going on on our shoulders and then we, we've been withered down and bruised and battered by life itself, just getting into the shit storm. It's like literally, we, we're, we're just pushed towards this cyclone, this shitstorm of life, and then it spins us around and then we're sitting here 10 years later going, what the fuck is wrong? The reasons why I can depict this so well is when I look at this and I, when I look at patterns, this is just all I see. When I ask people why they got married, people go, oh, because I love them or we've been together for that long, this was the right step. It was all for the wrong reasons. And so the reasons why I've really had a good think about this is because I've seen the, the destruction and the chaos that divorce ensues. The kids. First and foremost, they led without a mum. They led without a dad. I know, I know, like, and, and, and from speaking from experience, I know that if I was to get married, I would not care so much more about my kids anymore. I would not put the energy, I would not put the time, I'd not put the effort. Not because I didn't want to, but because I'm thinking the energy, effort, and time that I put into them to teach them, to lead them, it's kind of lost. Okay, the reasons why it's lost is because I'm going, well, Kerry's going to find another man. They're probably going to father my kids. They're going to, he's going to teach them some shit. What's the point of me pouring this effort? It's kind of lost. You know, you can't, you, they're, they're no longer yours. This thing that you're building, this artwork. It's like when you're a kid and you're playing with like Lego and you're trying to build something and then another kid comes in and fucks it up. You're like, well, this isn't mine anymore. So go take this. Go take this away. There's no point. I want something that I can build, I can construct selfishly. That's the first step. The second step is that if I did get divorced, and then there were, I had a girlfriend, Kara's got a boyfriend, there's kind of this psychological battle in like, uh, now we start to use the kids against us. And I see this in a lot of relationships that you, they use the kids against us. And if it doesn't end amicably, and there's all this financial shit involved, I'm gonna get pissed off, she's gonna get pissed off, she's gonna want more, etc., etc. And when the finances come into play, people get really weird with money and finances and how much they should make. Me, as a provider, I'm like, I made all the money, so I deserve all the money. She's like, hey dude, I supported you. I, I supported you when you were fucking nobody. Your stocks were like at one cent and now they're at $100. I deserve all the credit for that because without me, you wouldn't have been able to do this. Both are right, both are wrong. Point is, there's a lot of destruction. So here are seven things that I believe will help you keep your marriage together. 
Hopefully these will help you. These are things that I've processed. I think these will go from most important to least, uh, not so much least important. All of these are, are super important. And feel free, if I've missed any points, to add some to the comment section down below. Point number one, you and your partner, you and your wife are missing an aligning and compelling vision of the future together. What does that mean? When you guys come in together, you guys form a partnership, there's her, there's you coming together, and ultimately, when you come together, you're like, oh, sweet, cool, we're going to have kids. And then like, you go about your day, she goes to work, you go to work, you have kids, she now has to stay home, you now have, you, you kind of just like move along with life. And you're not really thinking about a compelling vision together to stay together. Like, for me, I had to sit down and go, hey, Kerry, what do we want for our future? What do we want for our kids? What do we want here? What kind of legacy are we trying to build together? It's kind of a goal so that we're trying to work towards this. And when you can work towards this, you are two players in a game working towards all the battles and all the enemies and all the shit to try to get your family over there. And the, the very first thing I want you to think about is having this compelling vision for the future will actually align you. It'll create alignment. It'll be like, okay, well, hey, this is the most important thing in our goal. Fuck whatever you thought was your personal goals before. Fuck, fuck all the traveling and all the crazy stuff that you wanted. And Lynn, fuck off all your hobbies for a second. Those things can take second place. This is now the most important thing that we need to work together. And I think the craziest part is when you have an aligned vision and aligned goal that you both want to work together, you both are aligned to this vision. It's both important to you. Then ultimately, you just kind of stick together and you're fighting for this. And it has to be like something that you both want. The problem is if you don't have this, well, my wife suddenly wants to do music, she wants to do drama, she wants to go traveling, I want to go play tennis, I want to go play drumming, I want to go be a musician, and then now we're kind of like disaligned, we're kind of finding our own place and we're not together. This is really important because it leads on to this following thing. And I want to give you an example. So with me and Kerry, one of the biggest things that I would love to create is I would love to create some sort of a family legacy. I would love to create some sort of a, a, a company and a business that that does great things, some sort of philanthropy, some sort of things that we can help the world, some sort of things where we make tons of money and we can te teach our kids the skill sets and then hopefully one day our children kind of work in inside of the business and then they take over. That's selfish and that's like this organization that we keep in our family. And I, the, the thing that I think about is why did I need to start from zero and then get to 10 and then make my kids go to school and start from zero all over again and get to 10. It absolutely makes no sense to me. If I've built from zero to 10, I, myself and Kerry, we want our, our kids to stand on our shoulders and go from 10 to 20 and then pass that on to the next generation. So that is our aligned vision for our future. How do we actually create something that we can build so that our kids step on our shoulders and then take that to the next level? You'll see a couple of families that do this really well. You may or may not like him, but I think like if you look at Trump and what he's been able to build, he's going from zero to 10 or zero, he's, his parents went from zero to 10. He's now taken it from 10 to 100. And hopefully one day his kids, he'll be able to pass it on. They'll, they'll continue that legacy. I think that's very, very important. I think that's something that I would love to build. And most importantly, it doesn't matter if you like the man, but it, it, it keeps, it will keep the family aligned. Point number two, once you have this family vision, understanding the roles and the responsibilities that you and your wife play. Now, this is really critical. Understanding the roles. Now, inside the infancy where Ocean's four, Atlas is 15 months, Kerry needs to be the supporting mother. And what does the supporting mother need to do? She needs to play her role of being the supporting mother. She's taking care of the household. She's incubating the kids. She's looking after like the, the life almost, like my life. She's looking after my life. That's, that's what I say. And I've got this little incubator where she, her role is just to look after the kids, okay? Her role is to play that stay at home mom and play that wife that actually looks after, takes care of me, takes care of the kids. And the craziest part is when I say that, I know a lot of you guys and girls watching this will roll your fucking eyes because you go, wait, is that all? Is that all I get to play? And I go, let's reframe that for a second. The mum is actually the rock and the foundation of the family. Without the mum, there is no fucking family. There are no kids. There are no kids that get nurtured. There are, there are just kids that are dropped off in kindergarten and childcare centers to go rogue. They don't know, have any love. They don't have any respect. They're, they're not actually nurtured. They have no patience. They're not, they've got no capacity. They're screaming. Playing the mum, and this is the craziest part. When I say this, people just roll their eyes because they, you don't actually understand that the mum is the most important piece here in order to creating a family unit. And so what I want to get across here is that without no mum, there is no family. And if Kerry's not going to play that role, am I going to step in and play that role? Do I have the skill set, skill sets, the strengths? Am I naturally like born to play that role? No, as a man, my duty is go out to protect and provide. Make enough money to give her a home, to give her food, to give her the resources, to give her the things that she needs in order to protect the family. My job is to look after Kerry, look after Atlas, look after Ocean. Her job is to look after Atlas, look after Ocean, look after myself. And so there's this key thing. 
as the protector and the provider, that's my job. I need to go out there. I need to protect. I need to provide them. I need to provide them for them physically. I need to provide for them mentally. I need to provide for them financially. I need to also just make sure I can't just bring the money home. I need to make sure, is she okay? Does she need like time to go off there to get a massage? I need to make sure her well being is okay. I need to make sure that, hey, we have enough money that she can get a gym membership. Hey, if we need a car, a second car for her to go in places, I need to get her that car. That is my responsibility. I see that responsibility as a man and I take on that role. I take on that responsibility. She takes on the role as the mother, the nurturing person, the person that gives us love, the person that gives me life. I'm going out there, busting my balls, hustling to make sure that our kids stay alive, we have a roof over our heads, the bills are paid, the mortgage is paid, taxes are paid, we have no unhidden expected costs. Shit, if there's an accident, we have enough money that we can go to a hospital, get surgery, whatever it is, touch wood. The craziest part about this is when I say this, most people, we've been conditioned to go, wait, that, that just sucks. Like as a man, you're just a slave, and as a woman, you're just like stuck at home and you're encapsulated in a jail, and like where is the fun in all of this? The reality is, the craziest part is when you become a mum, when you become a dad, you have responsibility. There is no fun in responsibility. There is simply just responsibility and the responsibility is to look after the next generation. And so the craziest part is when men and women don't respect their roles. And, the, and I've seen this quite often, that men will go to work and then they don't respect the stay-at-home mum. They'll come home, they'll go, where's my food? They'll be in tired, they'll be like, what have you been doing all day? You haven't looked, all you have to do is sit home, look after kids, I make so much money, you've got help, blah, 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 blah. And men don't understand how hard it is to emotionally look after children. That like you sit there and the kids are screaming, the kids are uh, running around, the kids are having energy, the kids are having tantrums. Like I sit down with the kids for an hour and when they're happy, I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. But at the same time, it's pretty tiring. When they are emotionally coming out my ass, when they are screaming, when they are yelling, dude, that, that, that thing just drains all the life out of me. And so as a mum, she's actually built, okay, with the skill sets and tools and, and wired in a way where she can actually like give patience to that. For me, I'm like, I want to get out of here. Hey, shut up. Hey, don't do this. Hey, I'm trying to control the situation like I do in business. And so when I look at her role, there is a tremendous amount of respect that goes into me as the man, respecting her as the woman, as the mum, taking care of the kids, nurturing, because I know that without her, it, it's impossible. I couldn't do this. Does that make sense? I go, hey, Kerry, if I had to put myself in your shoes, fuck no, I could not do that. Respect. The role needs to get done. Okay, if the role doesn't get done, the family unit breaks. No one's raising the kids. Kindergarten. Other your kids are raising your kids. And God knows what their values and principles are. And then at the same time, there needs to be respect from the woman to actually go to, to the man to go, hey, thank you so much for providing. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate this. Hey, thank you for, for having that bike or paying for the bills or just taking on the burden and responsibility. It's this thing of this respect. I think it's the second most important thing. Firstly, if, you don't, if you're not aligned to one, one, one goal, one big mission, one big cause, then you, you don't have any roles to play. You go, oh, fuck, I don't care about raising great kids. Well, there's no, there's no point in playing roles. No one will play the roles. So first is have one big goal, one big mission. Second is be aligned in raising the kids and respecting each other's roles. The roles that need to play is the role of a mother and a role of a man. Okay, I'm going to say role of a man because the role of the man is to protect and provide as well as give respect to the mother. And the role of the mother is to actually nurture, to nurture, to create the life, to, to, to give the kids the emotional support and actually to give the man the emotional support as he produces and goes out there and hunts. Third point, so we've covered two points. This is gonna take a while, but this is a bit of a rant. Third point, lack of connection, both physically and emotionally. Okay, lack of connection. We obviously talk about this, lack of physical intimate sex. Sex is something that people think is literally just for the man. It's actually not for the man, it's actually this amazing spiritual bonding between both men and women to actually go, wow, both of us matter and there's this feeling of connection that we feel connected with us. I can bring this back to a few weeks ago, Kerry and I were feeling a bit disconnected. I was going through like a man flu, I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself. She's like, hey man, you gotta man the fuck up. I'm like, hey, don't tell me to man up. That's the worst thing your wife can tell you to do, it's just to man up. I'm like, hey, I just need some affection, I need some love. She didn't get that. We kind of disconnected. The craziest part about this is we didn't talk for about one to two days. So it was kind of off. And then we had amazing physical sex and it kind of just fixed the whole fucking thing. I know. I know it sounds superficial, but it's also very important. The second point I want to get to outside of physical sex. So if you're not physically having sex and you're not connecting and you're not allowing your wife to enjoy that, you need to work on that. I know that's something that I've needed to work on for a long time because in, in the household of being Asian, there is no conversation around sex. There is like, the only conversation around sex is have no sex. And then suddenly, by the time you hit 25, it's like, yo, why don't you have a girlfriend? 
Motherfucker. My, you never taught me how to have a girlfriend. You taught me how to go up, how to, how to get good grades, how to go to high school, how to, how to only look at books, don't have any friends, don't have any girlfriends especially. There are no girlfriends allowed. And then by the time I graduate, I hit 20 years old, you're like, why don't I have a girlfriend? I'm sorry. I digress. I want to move on to this thing. It's emotional connection. The, I, I would actually say this surpasses. This is, like, this is like head sex. This is like mental sex. This is emotional sex right here. This is your ability to connect to, with your wife and your partner and emotionally speak to them and connect with them as if you're, the, the, you're their best friend. They are your therapist. There is nothing here. The most important thing when you're trying to connect with your wife, your partner, your best friend, the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with in trying to go after this massive mission is being truthful, honest, vulnerable. You connect through vulnerability. You connect through, hey, like, I didn't have a good day today. This is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling like I've got this struggle. And then you talk it out. The other person can be the therapist. It's amazing. Kerry does this wonders for me. And I don't know if all women are like this, but this is what Kerry has. She's like God tier at this, where she's able to be like a therapist. She's able to take all my shit in, not freak the fuck out. She takes it in. She absorbs it and then just mirrors it back to me. And then I'm like, oh my God, I feel so much better. And then at the same time, I played that role for her. We're honestly playing each other's role in therapy so that one person can be heard without judging judgment without like her imparting her own judgment and her own fears onto my thoughts that I'm giving her at the moment in time. For example, I might come to her and go, hey babe, like we just got this crazy tax bill. I'm a bit freaking out right now. This is a crazy bill. It just came out of fucking nowhere. Or hey babe, um, I'm, I'm trying to launch this thing. I'm a bit afraid. I don't know if I should fucking do content again. It's, it's scary, scary. I don't know. I'm a bit stuck. And then she, we're just kind of working through that. And she is sitting there listening and she's just going, oh, that's fine. Like, what do you think you should do next? What, tell me about your ideas. She's not going, hey, fuck you, loser. You better, you better make this happen. You better, you better produce now. We're all fucked. She, she's emotionally controlled and calm to play that role so that we can actually connect and be honest with each other. And I think this is one of the, this, this is definitely one of the things that her and I have had to work with over time. And in the first seven years of our relate, we didn't have this. It took time to actually build that trust, to actually allow each other to, to play off and soundboard off each other. And when you do this, you literally feel like you have the best friend for life. And I think inside of your relationship, this is like, do not take this shit for granted. This is one of the best things because it's like, it's free therapy. You have a best friend. You don't need anybody else. Point number four. So point number four is you have low capacity. You have low patience. Okay, you have low patience because you have low capacity. What does this mean? It means you lose your shit all the time. It means you're constantly upset. It means you're constantly on edge. It means you're constantly like the kids will break something and you fucking yell or care or your wife will do something stupid and you'll yell at her or like people will make a mistake and then you get so edgy because you're you have low capacity. What does low capacity mean? It means you have not done enough for yourself, whether or not you're not fit enough whether or not you're tired from walking up the stairs and you have low capacity and you're just like on edge, there, things just trigger you so easily because you have not built yourself to actually handle stress because you haven't put in the work. This is a craziest part. Kara and I work out in the morning, not because I want to work out, because I know I have to work out. I know I have to stay in shape. I, I have to do my journaling. I have to get my shit done so that when I do work, I then have the capacity, I then have the patience to, to go out there and, and have more patience for the kids, have more patience for the family. I know. That every day when I look at my schedule, if I don't get shit done, it will bleed into the next thing. And so if I don't get my work block done, I take that very seriously. Because if I don't do this, basically what happens, I carry that, that, that kind of baggage, that leftover stuff. I carry it into the family block and Kerry knows that. I'm on my phone. I'm constantly like annoyed. I'm triggered. Something's happening. And she doesn't know what's happening. So the craziest part is this. You need to take care of your shit in order like, to be better for your family. You need to take care of your shit. If you're not healthy, you need to be healthy. If you're not exercising, you need to exercise. If you haven't slept well, it is your responsibility to sleep well. It's not on your partner that you didn't get a good night's sleep. It is your responsibility that you sleep well so that you wake up refreshed. If you're not feeding your body with nutrients, it is important that you feed your body with these nutrients. If you're not calm, then it is important that you do some meditation or some journaling. If you're not feeling full, it is important that you go find something fun and you do it for yourself so that you get full. Everything that you do, you have to do to an extreme so that you have more to give back to your family. Lack of capacity is one of the biggest reasons why people lose patience. People lose patience, you, you get triggered, you then get into another fight. And there's one thing that me and Kerry live by, which is like, we're always one fight away from divorce. Like we take our fight seriously. Like if we don't need a fight, don't, don't fight. But if we're going to fight, we're going to open up that can of worms. There's a crack that opens and fuck, all hell breaks loose. Because you open a crack, you hit that again and you hit that again. It, divorce doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a period of time. Most people, by the time they, they, they thought about getting divorced, it was like, man, like you can't fix that. Because 
it actually happened here. And for most people, they just wait, 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 because they, they don't have any courage. They don't have any commitment. They fucking like can't even make any decisions. So you just wait until it gets bad enough. By the time it's bad enough, you can't fix that shit. Lack of capacity. Okay, next one. Point number five. Lack of awareness around your own triggers and patterns. Okay, so this is a crazy part. I had no idea this existed before I got married, had kids. But I have something called patterns and triggers and emotional DNA and programming that's inside me. And all this shit that, that is inside of me right now, like my behaviors, my patterns, things that I would get upset about, are things that I've seen as a kid that my dad and my mom used to do. And as I saw these things that my dad and my mom used to do, I actually took them on. They, they became ingrained in me. They became installed into my subconscious brain unconsciously, right? I do things unconsciously. So for example, let's just say Carrie just breaks an egg or she drops a glass and she's like clumsy. My reaction to that, my trigger is not my current trigger now in my current state. It's actually like the most normal trigger for me is actually taking on the role of my dad when I saw him when I was young. Like if my mum had dropped something and my dad would crack the shits because he didn't have any, or he didn't have all of this in place and, and she, he would talk to her and he'd say, how could you break that? You're such an idiot. We don't have any money. You're so clumsy all the time. Guess what happens? Guess me, I'm sitting there as a little boy. I'm watching all this happen. That's getting ingrained into me going, oh my God, yep, this is what happens when someone breaks a glass. This is the emotional response. This emotional response gets sucked into me. And then guess what happens when Carrie does that? It just comes out of me. And so it's this awareness around our patterns and our triggers that we need to take back control of. Because these patterns and our triggers that we have are in our subconscious mind, okay? And we unconsciously do things based on things that we've seen in the past. And the craziest part is this. As a parent, shit's unknown. So, so what I mean by shit's unknown is I don't know what happens when Ocean turns five. I know what happens when she turns four, three, two, one. Okay, so I've kind of mastered my patterns and behaviors around that. If we've worked on them, if I've been aware, I've been able to change them, I can work on them. But great, as she turns five, guess what happens? There's something new. She does something new and then I go back to, oh my God, this is what happens when I was three and my older sister was five and my older sister did this when she was five and then my parents behaved like that. And so I take on the behavior of my parents on, on my sister and I, play, and I replay that in that present moment. And so this is the craziest part. These are patterns and triggers that you fight every fucking day because every day is a new day. Every new, every new day, your daughter grows up a little bit older. Your wife gets a little bit older. All of this in the future is unknown. Therefore, the only certainty that you and I have, you and I want certainty as human beings. The only certainty is going back to seeing what our parents did to us in the past. Going back to seeing what your auntie did. Going back to the most important people. Taking that emotional response, that big response, and then it's, it's, in, it's inside of us. It's like programmed, it's sucked in. Okay. If you don't take back control of this, you can't master it. And you can't master it. Basically, you have the same relationship that your parents have. So this is the saying that people go, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The reasons why it doesn't fall far from the tree is because people need to be aware of this in order to change their patterns. Most people aren't. So if they're not aware of these patterns and it's like, fuck, that, that's the pattern I got from my dad at that response. Was it a good pattern? Is it, is it helping me get to what I want? No, it isn't. I need, to I need to bring awareness to that and I need to stop that behavior. That's the unconscious programming that we have. Point number six. I think this is a very critical one. Divorce happens because you do not protect the family nucleus from your family and from your friends. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean, there's a lot of chatter that's gonna go around from my mum, my dad, Kerry's mum, Kerry's dad, your parents' mums, your parents' dads about how our family should run. Kerry's mum is literally telling us, oh, you shouldn't homeschool, you should take it to the private school, you should do this, you should do that, because they, they, they're just like, they have no awareness of the, any of the situation, and they're like, hey, like our kids have no idea what they're doing, and because we had no idea, so Carrie's mom is thinking, Carrie has no idea what she's doing because I had no idea what I'm doing. Therefore, there's an assumption that I need to tell her what to do now. So Carrie's mom and my mom and my, my parents and my dad, blah, 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 they will just tell us what to do. And the craziest part is this, we need to create a buffer. We need to create a buffer zone out there, a protection, a bubble, where we literally sit down and go, hey, is this what we want? Are we, should we listen to these people? Are these people credible? And the craziest part about this is this. It's very easy for me to go out there and unconsciously listen to my parents. If I sit down, have, if, if I sit down there and I have dinner with my parents and, and we can hear gossiping, we can hear drama, we can hear all this noise, and I tell my parents, hey, I've got, uh, I've got Paris and Nanny. I know my sister would be sitting there going, oh, she's got three kids, we've got two kids. She's like, why do you need a nanny? Look, I'm doing it with two kids. And then my mum would be like, oh my God, Carrie's so, she's, you know, she's, she's so relaxed. She's doing all these things. You shouldn't do it like that. You shouldn't treat her so nice. You shouldn't. And then I would go home and I would take that belief in. 
Like I'd sit there at dinner, I'd listen to all the shit. I'd let my mind be filled with shit. And then guess what happened when I, when I come home? If me and Kerry have a bit of an incidence where our capacity is low, like she knows that after seeing, seeing my family, I need like a warning sticker on, on the back for, for the next 48 hours because I've just inhaled a whole bunch of shit right? Unconscious shit. It wasn't deliberate from them. It's just stuff that they say that you actually have to filter out from the family, family nucleus and not bring back home. Okay. They don't know they're doing it, but the craziest part is it just happens. Okay. You just bring home, you inhale mental shit that they're saying that people are saying around you. They don't even know if, whether it's good or bad. They, they have good intentions about it. It comes out wrong. And then it changes. It alters. It's like a little devil speaking to, into your ear. And then I'll sit down there and I'll be like, oh my God, like something will happen. And let's say Kerry didn't make me like lunch on time or she just forgot to make me lunch. My capacity would literally be like this. How dare you not make me lunch? Do you know how much I do for you? I have gotten you a nanny. Do you know that my sister doesn't even have a nanny? I wouldn't even say my sister, but like the nanny thing would pop up because it was like a trigger and it's sitting there so dormant, ready to fire off as a bomb. It's ready there to fire off as a bomb. Basically what would happen is I would tell her off and I would blow at her at a situation that she had absolutely no idea, no control of because I didn't actually guard myself. Okay. So these are very, these are very important things that you have to understand that your wife, your partner, your husband are the most important people that you have to protect from the outside noise. You have to protect it. People will just undoubtedly give you shit. You have to create that bubble to reinforce it, to go, Hey, like, I can see what's happening here. No, I don't want to listen to that. You might have to like step away for a bit. You might have to distance yourself. You have to understand that in order to avoid divorce, your most important person that you need to protect is your wife or your husband. This last thing that I think, it's this lack of commitment. This lack of commitment inside of Western culture. And the reasons why divorce rates are so high inside of Western culture, we don't have any kind of religious beliefs, cultural beliefs or shame around like getting divorced. Like there, there are other things around the world, like in Muslim countries or in Indian countries or in Asian countries where if you get divorced, there's so much fucking shame. So there's this external fear so much on the outside of, of going, oh my God, I can't get divorced. Like I'll bring, I'll bring shame to my family name. That will be like, my parents were actually, you're so afraid to get divorced that you just make it happen. It's a good and a bad thing. It's bad because you're not together for the right reasons, but it's good. At least you're together, right? In that sense. The shame around religion, which is like, yo, if you get divorced, you're like, you're, you're, you can't remarry. You can't remarry, you get divorced, you're like living alone for the rest of your life. In Western society, where shit's so free, you don't have any of this. And so the craziest part is, oh cool, divorce is like, literally, are oh, we just gonna break up? Oh, don't worry about the kids, we'll just go to lawyers, we'll split it all up. It's like a breakup. Like people don't take it seriously anymore. And so this last thing is this lack of commitment, this lack of mentality, this lack of, we're all in. Like, you are my ride or die. Like for Kerry, when I, when I think about her, I'm like, you are my ride or die. You have to understand, Kerry, and I made this very clear to her. You have to understand, as a man, I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you physically. We're going to need to have sex. You have to understand that you're the only vagina I'm ever going to see for the rest of my fucking life. I have millions that I could see, but yours is the only one I see. And when she actually understands that, she can actually understand, wow, like, I, I, I will give myself to him. I will give my love to him. And it's this ride or die mentality. I don't know why I talked about sex for a second, but I, I, it was a point that I made to her that I'm like, hey, Kerry, do you know? That as I become older, as I get more wiser, as my worth increases, as I age, man, like I'm going to have all these other women. And yet I'm not going to look at them because you are my ride or die. You are there mentally with me, emotionally, spiritually with me. We have great visions, great goals towards the future. And you have to understand that she needs to look at that the same way that this guy is the king and he's going to be with, he's the only guy that I'm going to look at. And, it's, and, and I know it sounds weird because everybody else is conditioned that to go, oh, that's yuck or that's shit. And it's like, Without that mentality, without that commitment of not looking outside your blinders, this is the only person that you get to look at. Everybody else is ugly. Everybody else has a flaw with them. Everybody else, uh, I don't care. I'm not even looking. I'm not even entertaining the idea. The craziest part is this. My older sister, she'll come down and visit us and she'll be like, Lynn, you're living on the Gold Coast and, and on the Gold Coast, it's 26 degrees Celsius, sunny every single day. So there are chicks on the beach walking around pretty much in, in, in nudes, right? They're walking out with these skimpy bikinis and she's like, Lynn, like, Kerry, aren't you scared that Lynn's looking around? And Kerry's like, nope. And I'm like, nope, I don't see them. I literally don't see them. She's like, yeah, but don't you think that girl's attractive? I'm like, nope, no opinion. She's like, yeah, but you, you and, and then she'll try to tell me. She's like, yeah, but you, you're allowed to say that she's attractive. I'm like, no, I, do, I choose not to. I don't even choose to open the door one tiny bit. And the reasons why I know, because once you open this door, it's like, a, it's like a, you, you can just begin to open the next door and the next door and the next door. And the next minute, you know, we're fucking having an open relationship. 
She's banging other guys, I'm banging other guys. It, it fucking just becomes really weird where there is no family nucleus anymore. There are seven things. I want to recap them for you. The first thing is lack of alignment, compelling future that you're both aligned to for your family. The second thing is lack of knowing your roles and respect for each other's roles. She plays the mum, I play the dad, I play the man, etc., etc. It's lack of physical and emotional connection. You're not each other's therapist. You're like, kind of like, you don't trust each other enough. You kind of freak out when the other person spills shit on you and you can't handle it, right? Lack of patience due to low capacity. Okay, so you're, you're constantly losing your shit because you haven't done enough. Okay, whether it's enough work, whether it's enough of a workout, whether or not it's enough time for yourself, you haven't done enough. Okay, because you don't take that shit execution seriously. You then have lack of awareness around your triggers and patterns that were brought on to you younger. When you were there as a little boy, watching your parents lose their shit over something, you now adopted that model of the world. When you were five years old, you now watch them behave differently. You're now bringing that into the situations. You have to be aware, have to always be aware of your triggers and patterns to be able to reshape them, to try not to get into an argument, okay? You don't protect, reason number six, you don't protect, okay, your shell, your family from the people around you. You go there, you listen to other people, you take that in and you bring that home and, you, and then you explode unexpectedly. And then finally, you have that lack of commitment. You have that lack of ride or die mentality. We live in a Western world where you're not governed by shame. You're not governed by religious beliefs. You're not governed by death. If you get divorced or you cheat, you die. Like you get shot. We're governed by a lot of freedom here. But what come, comes freedom comes what? Comes a lot of choices. Comes not a lot of commitment. Freedom reduces commitment. And so without a lot of commitment, you can't have that ride or die mentality. You keep opening the door. My suggestion is, as I would like to have it, I would never like Kerry to open the door. I would always like her to go, hey, this is my guy. This is my guy and, and vice versa. So that being said, those are my seven, seven topics. The reasons why I'm so passionate about this is number one, I just feel called to see, I see tons of families and I just wish that their children could have better parents. I, I just see tons of families bickering and fighting. The world could be a much more productive place if the man and the wife didn't have to fight so much and they were just more useful in doing things that could like help the world become a better place or, or grow, the, grow, grow their kids. So that being said, those are my seven reasons. I know this is a long video, but hopefully if you got through it, let me know your thoughts. Comment down below with what your favorite reasons are or if there's anything else that you want to add to it. And with that being said, have a fantastic day. If you want to subscribe, hit that subscribe button and uh, share this with somebody that needs to hear this, whether it might be your wife, your husband, whatever it is. Thank you. God bless. Have a great day.